Welcome to our webinar this evening on Eco Retrofit for Householders Unit 2 on Air Tightness. I'm really pleased to have our expert speaker Diane Hubbard of Green Footsteps to talk to us about air tightness this evening. Um, and I hope, as you can see from this picture with the door and the air leaking underneath it, that um, we can give you some really useful uh, ideas around making your home less drafty and more airtight this evening. So without further ado, I'll do a quick bit of intro. Diane will ta start talking about 10 past six and run until roughly quarter to 10 to seven, which is when we'll start with the Q&A. And so please bring all your questions and um, please drop them into the Q&A and I will take them through, take you through those questions at the end and we'll have about half an hour to run through all the different questions that we're asked. I'll put them to Diane, answer as many as possible and then towards the end about 20 past seven I'll run a second poll and, and some other information and then we'll close on time at half past seven. So for those of you who don't know very much about Cumbria Action for Sustainability, we do a lot more than talks about retrofit. We have all sorts of different projects. We're getting, we've got a lot of different things going on. I'm not going to talk about any of those in detail right now. You can see from the pictures there that we do all sorts of different things, but I would encourage you to go and look on the website, on the CAFS website, if you haven't already um, done so or you're not familiar with some of the things that we do. In terms of the energy services team, I'm part of the energy services team. We have a range of different services and projects going. Some things are free, some things are paid for. So on the free side, we have Cold to Cozy Homes Cumbria, which involves an energy advice call or visit for people who are eligible. Lots of people are eligible. So do keep in mind that's really helpful to run through and check of all the things that you might be doing to cut um, your energy bills and your energy use. We also do short general advice calls. People have got one-off question about PV or insulation, something like that. Again, it's it's something that you could really um, you can just ring up and one of our team can can answer your question. Um, and um, I also do a retrofit consultation over the phone as well. So for people who are thinking about whole house retrofit, you've got gathered a certain amount of information, but you want to just have a sort of a short conversation on the phone about that and run through the details, we can do that. On the paid for side, we have um, an energy audit service called, we use a product called Home Retrofit Planner, which is an energy model and it works out the heat loss from your house and under different scenarios, more insulation, different things done to it, can work out how much that heat loss might reduce. So that's something that we can do. Obviously that's a paid for service, as is our thermal imaging. And we run courses and webinars like this one. Um, some of them are free. This one particular is, is paid for by um, the Energy Redress Scheme, which is why it's free for you. And but we're extremely grateful for anyone who don't makes a donation to CAFs when you do book on or at any other time, because it really helps us do more with what we've got. So it's re really appreciated. So um, I'd like to start by introducing Diane before we start the, the, the talk and um, the presentation. So Diane is a mechanical engineer and really well, well up on building physics and has been looking at this for quite a number of years. Um, she has a master's from the Centre for Alternative Technology and has been working as Green Footsteps now for quite a while um, where she does the air tightness testing work using a thermal camera in some cases and can do energy calculations for buildings and, and, and she's also got passive house expertise um, and a number of other relative, relevant cost qualifications. So we're, we're really delighted to have Diane with us here this evening and she really is a mine of useful information. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and Diane, um, over to you. I'll make myself mute as well. To unmute myself first, that's the problem. So 
You can hear me now, yes? Yes. yes. Good. Right, okay. I'll shout properly. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, hi, nice to see so many people here. Uh, well, rather not see people here, but I know you, that you're there somewhere. Anyway, so um, yes, welcome. Anyway, hopefully you're going to gain uh, some stuff out of this presentation. Um, it's really great to sort of see the mix of people that are, uh, are here. Um, um, some of you might find this, I mean, this is aimed at sort of introduction, really. Um, so some of you might find we're recapping on things that you already know, um, but hopefully there'll be a little bit in here for everybody. Um, so uh, Tina's kindly uh, given a little bit of background, just recapping on that. So, so the reason I got into this originally, to be honest, was because... I live in an old house and I wanted to know what to do with it really and I kept concluded that basically at that time people didn't know what to do um, and so sort of my my sort of the things I've got into have really been led by that sort of from that starting point so I started looking at insulation to start off with but then I quite rapidly realized that air tightness was something that we really needed to look at and the other things I've done since have really sort of sprung from that so I do the ventilation side of things because I either because of the link to air tightness and it's important that we we sort of model our what we're doing properly which is why the passive house stuff is in there really so so it looks a bit widespread but there is a good sort of strategy through there as to why why I've done all of those things but that's my background roughly anyway so so um what I'm going to talk about is air tightness but what is air tightness um the thing we're really interested in is is infiltration um, and that's the the uncontrolled flow of air through the gaps and cracks in the building fabric and this diagram here is really helpful um, and it shows the sort of typical things that we're looking at so things like where the waste pipe leaves the sink or under the back door or around the windows or the loft hatch um, or gaps around the extract fan, all those sort of things is what we're talking about, or coming up through the floorboards. Um, so a whole range of, of, of things. And what when we start talking about air tightness, it's basically it's a quantification of that infiltration. Um, and one of the things I'm going to mention a few times is, you know, one of the, the main ways of, of quantifying it is to carry out an air tightness test. Now, if you've ever watched Grand Designs, you'll see this test being done on new builds. And that's where, where it's mainly applied uh, to new build properties. But um, there's a real benefit in looking at existing buildings as well using this method because... When we're talking about air tightness, people assume it's just about drafts, but it, it's about so much more than that. And I'll come on to that in a couple of minutes. Um, but what we've what we've got here, we've got a, a photograph of the uh, a, a blower door test, which is what that test is, is called. And on the right hand side, we've got a couple of slides that show thermal images of the building when it's under those test conditions. Um, so what we've got is the, the building is actually uh, uh, the pressure is reduced inside the building compared to outside and what's happening is that um, it's warmer inside it's heated it's a winter's day um, and the cold air is being drawn through those cracks and crevices and what we're actually seeing in these images is the cold trails of air as as it it comes into the building so the top uh, picture on the right hand side is of a, a floor wall junction and it's the air coming uh, under the uh, bottom of the skirting board primarily and then being dragged across the floor um, and in the lower one we've got uh, a picture of a, a loft hatch just a board sitting in a frame you know how most basic loft hatches are constructed and again what we're seeing there is the cold air that's coming around the side of that board and then into the occupied space from the, the, the cold uh, loft area 
So, so what we, we're seeing here is, is it's sort of the, the, the thermal imaging camera is, is, is actually showing what's happening under these test conditions. So what, 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 but that doesn't re relate to reality really, does it? But, you know, having this test on the building, but, but what we've, what the, um, the difference in pressure actually is uh, that, that the fan creates in the building is the equivalent of sort of a wind of about sort of 20 or to 30 mile an hour wind. Now, recently, we've clearly had those sort of conditions. Um, in normal times, when the wind blows, you would, you know, you would see maybe you'd feel the drafts on the windward side of the building. But on the leeward side, the air would be leaving, so you wouldn't be aware of it. So your perception in your home, say, on a windy day would be that that particular window on the windward side was leaky, but you wouldn't be aware of it leaving on the leeward side out of a, a door, say. Um, but what the test does is it applies an even pressure to the building as a whole. So you can judge all of the characteristics of the building quite uniformly and then judge their impact on the building. So it's a very handy test to actually um, carry out. Um, so, so why do we need to focus on air tightness? Why is it important? We all know about drafts um, and that's sort of the first thing that we all go to. You know, if you've got too much air going through your actual living space, then um, it's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, the physical exchange of air is going to increase your energy use. But the other thing is that in terms of um, thermal comfort, if you're sitting in your lounge and you have a draft across your ankles, then your reaction is to perceive that the air temperature is lower than it actually is. And, and so you tend to reach for your thermostat. Um, and increase the thermostat, whereas actually it's a localised draft maybe that's affecting you. So, so there's two, 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 two sort of particular aspects that are relevant in terms of direct effect on us. But there's a few th more things we need to bear in mind. So if you've actually got um, air moving th through insulation, so um, say loft insulation, uh, you know, your normal sort of uh, insulation bats you'd have above a, a, a flat ceiling. Um, if you've got air moving through that, that affects the performance of that insulation. So you don't get the insulation value that you would expect to get. And particularly um, when we're looking at maybe retrofitting internal or external wall insulation, you could be spending quite a lot of money on doing something. And if you've actually got air routes through that insulation, it will affect how well it performs. Um, so, so it's important from that point of view. Um, another side of it is that um, what you could have is, you know, in your home, um, the air is relatively moist. Uh, it might be warmer than outside, but in terms of what it's carrying in terms of absolute moisture levels, it's going to have a higher moisture load. And if that warm air then travels into your building fabric, um, as it cools, it's uh, there's a risk which it's going to condense and condense somewhere where you don't want it to. So it might condense around timbers in structure, say, and that uh, increase in moisture level could then shorten the life of either the building as a whole or it could um, shorten the life of that particular upgrade. So ensuring that the air, unwanted air from the inside of the building doesn't get into the building fabric is quite important. Um, another side of it is uh, uh, making sure that the ventilation system performs. More and more of us are sort of looking at um, uh, more complex version, more complex ventilation systems. And as our air tightness of our buildings improve, we do need to focus more heavily on a ventilation. Um, but that ventilation has got to perform in the right way. Um, and if we've got a high level of infiltration, if we've say got mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, then that's not going to, it's not going to be recovering all of the heat it possibly should if we've got roots, uh, air roots through the building fabric. So, you know, you are, again, you'll have made a significant investment in some equipment there. And unless you've got a good level of air tightness, it's not going to be for performing at its best. 
So um, I need to sort of talk a bit about numbers for a while. So um, apologies to, to people, but it, it's important that sort of you understand a, a context, really, I think, because um, um, it, it will it will aid your your, your further thinking. Um, so the blower to ore test, we I prepare the building exactly as uh, it's prepared for a new build property. Now, what that means in retrofit is that we're often covering things that can add quite a lot to the um, uh, the airflow through a property. So things like you might have an open fireplace, um, which clearly could draw quite a lot of air through. Uh, you've perhaps got extractor fans, uh, you might have a boiler that's drawing air from inside the property as well. You might have a stove. Um, so I, these are excluded from the test because what we're trying to do is to not measure how much impact say an open fireplace has. We're trying to measure the fabric, how leaky the fabric of the building is. Um, and and what you can then do afterwards is sort of add back in those impacts really of the uh, the other things and think about them separately rather than lumping everything in together um, so it's worth just highlighting that that really we're looking at the fabric itself not the, the things where it's a deliberate a deliberate item that increases the airflow through the building so working to this exactly the same protocol as for new build um, and there's two ways uh, of quantifying it and the the normal way from building regs in the uk is something called air permeability and that basically is the flow rate that something like the fan on the right hand side generates so that's an airflow in meters cube per hour and it's divided by the dwelling envelope so that's the floor the walls and whatever's happening at the ceiling the top floor ceiling so you've got the whole envelope it takes into account um that can be quite difficult to relate to you know as a somebody who's new to this um and one thing that's easier to relate to is actually air changes per hour which is comparing the flow rate of the fan to the volume of the building as a whole so you can you can sort of think of it as, as to how often the air is actually changing within the building how many times an hour it's changing when that pressure is applied the 50 pascals is is simply the the pressure difference that, that is being applied by the fan 50 pascals um, between inside and outside um, it, I normally operate as depressurization, so below outside, but you can uh, do it the other way and, and pressurize inside the building. So one of the things to sort of think about is it's quite, they can, the air permeability and the air change rate can be quite different things. So we've got two buildings here. We've got an L-shaped bungalow on the left hand side, and then we've got quite a a boxy house it's a quite cuboid and in the property on the right hand side um, if you do the calculation you'll see that the surface area of, of a cuboid like that house is roughly the same as the volume uh, in, in number terms but if you've got something like an l-shaped bungalow that's got quite a big surface area compared to the volume so um, the form of the building starts to become quite important when you're looking at, at um, sort of putting figures to air tightness. So bear that in mind when you're considering your home, what's the form of it? Um, and is that in itself likely to have an, have an impact? Um, and I suppose the importance, which, which do you go, which do you use if you're looking at your own home? Well, it depends on what you're after, really. Um, the, the, the air permeability, which relates it to the surface area, is quite helpful because, yeah, it is actually the fabric. It, it's what the outside of the building is, is doing. But if you're thinking more about maybe how much ventilation you need or you're thinking about mechanical ventilation, you might want to think of it as an air change rate. 
Um, so it depends on what you're actually what you're actually after as to how you should consider it. So what I've got here is some numbers that I think will help us to, to sort of uh, put it into context. We'll forget the units for the purposes of this discussion. We'll think of it as, as a cuboid house. OK, so passive house um, has to come in at, at uh, better than uh, at no worse than 0 0.6. And that is our changes per hour at 50 pascals. When we look at our new build requirements, um, the limit is 10 meters cubed per hour per meter squared at 50 pascals. So a figure of 10. Um, it's quite rare that new build houses have to come in at that. It's more typically, you know, for a typical sort of estate type house on gas, that they typically have to currently come in at about five. The regs are changing partway through this year, um, but that's currently what they have to do. Um, but if you say looking at mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, there's an expectation there that you're really looking at properties that are coming in at um, three or better to make it worthwhile. Um, now, a lot of the work, I'm not particularly going to talk about it today, but a lot of my, my research, my academic research that I've done is on traditional buildings, so pre-1900 houses. And one of the things that my uh, academic research did was um, people assumed that older houses were going to be much, much leakier than what we're putting up now. Um, and my conclusions are you get some bad ones, but actually they're nowhere near as bad as people think. Um, and basically people hadn't tested them. Um, and, and so they were making lots of assumptions about how bad they were going to be. And so what I've done is I've now tested hundreds of of existing buildings. Um, so I've got a pretty good feel for where things stand. And roughly about a third of unrefurbished pre-1900 houses come in at 10 or less, and some in, come in much better than that. Um, some are horrendous, but the worst house I've ever tested was built in 2015, and that came in at 36. So um, there are some quite dire houses still being built out there that one didn't need to be air tightness tested and and that's the reason why that that got through but horrendous for the householder um, but unless you test you don't um necessarily get a feel for what you've actually got in your building now so um these are some examples of houses so we've got two new build houses these ones on the right hand side um and we've got two older houses um, and you sort of say, well, which has got the best air permeability? Um, there, that one, the, the, that new build one's probably the biggest house. That one's probably the next one. That's just a bog standard 30 semi. And then we've got this like late 19th century semi as well. Um, so it's quite interesting. I mean, the 30s semi, when I tested that out, the air permeability is just under 15 on that. So that's not great. The um, that new build there that came out at just under five, about 4.9. Uh, this new build here, well, that came out at 6.1. And um, this 19th century uh, semi with original windows, well, that came out at 5.6. So you can sort of see, I mean, we're clearly talking about different insulation levels on properties, but in terms of air tightness, um, we, we've we've got you know that the uh, the brick built semi is not not the tightest but it's not that far off that new build that was built in the last couple of years in terms of air tightness so don't assume that old buildings are leaky so this is a photograph inside the that new build uh, sort of detached with the integral garage that I've just shown you. And one of the problems that we have with um, the way that we build houses now is that um, we're using plasterboard a lot. Um, and um, the way that plasterboard is commonly fitted in uh, uh, is using a method called dot and dab, basically dabs of adhesive onto the wall and then the plasterboard is stuck, stuck to it. 
Now, all the official guides say that the plasterboard should be edge sealed, so a continuous line of adhesive all around the perimeter of the plasterboard. But invariably, it's not fitted in that way. And what the image that we've got here on the left hand side is the detail of this corner here. I hope you can see where my cursor is. Um, so it's the detail of that corner we're looking at. And what we're seeing here is the building is depressurized, so my fan is going and it's taking air out, so it's, the pressure in the building is below the pressure outside, so we've, it's pulling cool air into the building through those cracks and crevices. And um, this is on the first floor, it's in one of the bedrooms, and what we're seeing here is we've got cold air going behind the plasterboard and then that that's being uh, that's coming out in places like sockets or at the uh, floor wall junction um, and you can see we've got some quite serious temperatures really it was a you know a reasonable winter's day and from uh, th this temperature point here we've got a temperature of 19 degrees on the wall but in that corner we've got 14 degrees now that difference is enough under normal conditions to uh, virtually prompt mould is getting to the point where you could get mould in that location and that's on a new build house um, so plasterboard can create uh, if it's fixed by dot uh, by uh, dot and dab can create some serious issues um, behind the um, you know serious issues with with reduced wall temperatures and that that thing that I was saying before about um, you know it bypassing the insulation the insulation is in the wall the air is being drawn down from the roof void behind that plasterboard so you are uh, you're bypassing the cavity wall insulation basically um so the ha the fuel bills in this property will be higher than they should be you know than the calculations um show so in older buildings what what have we got we have plaster now the thing is that all common building materials so stone um brick blocks they're all air permeable and um so uh when the wind blows you will actually get air moving through those walls um and the thing that stops the air movement in older buildings is the wet plaster it's that's the layer that stops the air from moving so if you remove that plaster and say put a uh, dot and dab plasterboard on top you're going to get air moving behind the um behind the plasterboard so when you're thinking about retrofit you need to realize that 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 plaster that's there already is actually fulfilling a role from an air tightness point of view and um it, it it's i, I realized you know builders are not that keen on wet plaster but um plasterboard just use of dot and dab plasterboard can really compromise the performance of of some um uh you know upgrade works so there it's the plaster that's the air tightness layer so that's a fundamental thing to be aware of so how do you achieve air tightness um, really there's there's four key steps in doing that um, you want to know where you're starting from really um, what your target is you need to develop a strategy to achieve that target and then it's down to making sure that the there is quality assurance really or the, the workmanship on the um, site is, achieves your aim so know where you're starting from so this is an example of a property that i looked at a while ago now um, where it's a 1990s barn conversion that had a couple of extensions in the early 2000s and the image on the right hand side is a thermal image when the building is depressurized so the fan is going and it's uh air is being drawn into the um the building and this photograph is taken in this portion of the building so one of the two th the extensions around the year 2000 um, and that has a sloping ceiling with a flat surface in it um, and we can see a lot in this this image here 
so we have a, a very nice looking beam um, that's got air leakage all the way along it. So we've got these cold trails of air coming down that side and the side we can't see, it, it's a, the same thing applied. Um, we have some uh, integral light fittings that are leaking here. And um, uh, the insulation has been held off around the light fittings. Um, so when it was uh, sort of halogen fittings, you know they were throwing out quite a lot of heat so there was a, a you know a, a requirement for the insulation to be held back off those now we're leds you know not checking out the same amount of heat so the insulation can be treated differently but this is all sealed this space is they can't get into it um and we've got um uh areas here what we, we're seeing here is we've got um timbers the uh, uh the roof timbers going across here and we've got whole areas where there's uh, insulation missing um, from within the within the void. So we've got a whole combination of things here with air leakage and missing insulation. Um, but without that, without having done a test, you wouldn't know what you've actually got there. You'd think it was built in the early 2000s, it should be fine, but actually it, it, it's quite problematic. Um, there's no requirement to test existing buildings at all. Air tightness tests, no, no requirement if you build an extension to, to test things. Um, it's purely a requirement for wholly new build properties. Um, so uh, th there's no sort of um, control other than the normal building regs procedure um, for how to, to deal with air tightness in, in extensions. Um, here's an example of a property I looked at, uh, it, well I've looked at in the last couple of months really, um, where the client uh, was about to uh, refit some bath a couple of bathrooms and uh, looking at internal wall insulation and I had a look at the building just before they started the works. Um, and this is a, a classic sort of example, if you can cast your mind back to that first slide, one of the things that that sort of it showed was um, air movement related to holes in walls for waste pipes and that sort of thing. And the image on the right sort of shows the way that the cold air is literally falling and being drawn around the, um, the bath panel here, which is a, um, it's a timber um, bath panel. And um, though we didn't take the bath panel off, my conclusion is that there's the air movement is likely to be coming through a combination of the floor under the bath and um, where the waste actually leaves the building. Um, but fortunately, you know, the client was about to, uh, they were about to sort of change the bathroom fittings. So um, they, they were sort of alerted to um, checking everything out before the new bathroom was, was put in. But we can see the cold air there, we can see those fingers. Um, um, but the client is better for, informed now for the, the next stage of their retrofit. Um, so a picture of that semi again, that brick built semi. Um, and this is part of a, a larger project where um, that building is, is being treated as a pilot for a, a large group of properties on this particular estate of buildings. Um, and it's undergoing a deep retrofit. Um, but the assumption until this test took place was that actually the buildings were going to be more leaky um, than, uh, than the, the test actually found. So that, that result has changed the approach that's, that's being used for this particular property. And um, that pilot then will be used for the rest of the buildings on, on that estate. So, so knowing where you're starting from is really important because it, it shows you how you should direct your, your, your money. Um, if you've got a building that is more airtight than perhaps you assumed, then it sends you in a direction more of ventilation and you don't, you're not spending on money on things that look at air tightness. On the other side of things, if the building is more leaky, then it sends you in a different direction. So it's a great tool for um, determining, uh, well, why is it wise expenditure really? What should you spend your limited resources on? 
then think about the target. Um, then what you know, we're talking about the planet. This is this is a personal decision from from your um, you know from your your viewpoint. So it's not down to uh, you know you know there isn't a right answer here. Um, it's what's moti what's motivating you. Are you trying to do the best you can do? Are you trying to get a certificate? Are you wanting to comply to Enerfit, which is the passive house um, standard for, for retrofit? Um, there's an AECB standard that you could go for. Are you interested in get, getting a badge or do you just want to halve your fuel bills? What's your objective? Um, and, and where does the air tightness then fit into that? So that's a personal decision. Um, and something that you you need to think about about what you're trying to achieve. So the next thing you've got to do is to develop a strategy, and this applies really to new builds as well as existing buildings. So the house, the house, it's the same house I showed you before, which is um, that's an, it's a new build property that is or a recent build, and um, the important thing is that it's designed in from the outset the air tightness is so as soon as you start thinking about how you're going to retrofit your home you need to start thinking about your air tightness strategy um, whether you're doing it yourself whether you're working with an architect it's got to be an integral part of it and it isn't all about fancy materials so in this house which just out of interest got a, a final test result well, i think about 0 0.4 um, they use, he used bog standard materials, mainly bog standard stuff that you can get from Travis Perkins. So he was using, he was trying to use standard materials as much as possible. He, it was wet plastered um, and that was a bulk of the air tightness layer. He used specialist tapes in places, but he tried to use standard material as far as possible. Um, but these these special materials now I, i'm hoping you can see uh can you see me or i got to come out of uh can you see me and um, what what we can probably do is we can sh we can swap the video in the shared screen and okay. um, it might be that other people can do the same so they can make you okay so you don't focus. need to so so if i waft things around that's what lift i'm lift it up a bit just so, lift it up Okay, right. So I'm going to start talking about um, more specialist materials. Okay, so people go on a lot about air tightness tapes, and you sort of look at them and you think, my goodness, that's a lot of money for something that doesn't look very uh, substantial. Think the thing to think about is is you know what we were that that drawing at the beginning. You know, a, a classic location for air leakage is around windows. You know a window sitting in a window reveal and the sun shines through that window and what happens is everything contracts and expands over time so the window expands at a certain rate plaster expands at a certain rate the window sill expands at a different rate and what happens is that over time that crack opens up and it's an air leakage route into the building and that's repeated in all those locations around your home the, the thing that air tightness tapes do is they go on behind the scenes. You don't see them when it's all finished. It's all hidden behind the plaster or plasterboard. And what they do is they cover over gaps like that. And they have the flexibility to cope with that movement over time. Their lifespan um, with a good quality tape is you know 50 60 years it's the life of the building i mean we design our building our new builds are designed to a 50 year lifespan um so it's designed to work behind the scenes so um it, it and it overcomes that that contraction and expansion so these are really valuable they're actually really quite straightforward to use um, they come in different types. It depends on what you're gluing to what. This is a general purpose one as an example. Uh, you get ones that are sort of split like plasters. So they have a, a split down the middle. So they're easier to apply to window frames, say. 
um, you get specialist things like if you're putting in an outside light, you get things like this, which is basically uh, has a small hole in it that you put a cable through. So the electrician can pull a cable backwards and forwards. He can fit a light. He doesn't see any difference. And this, this just sits on your air tightness layer. Again, it's hidden behind the scenes. And if you want a wood burning stove, say with an external air intake, you know, you've got, or for your waste pipes, you've got uh gaskets like this that when you're putting the waste pipe in you just squeeze it just goes over the uh, the waste pipe and um and it then gets taped to the air tightness layer so there's there's quite a lot of specialist stuff around um um it's not cheap but it does a quite an effective role i mean i've i've been into quite a lot of properties and i where a cable has gone through the wall if the builders try to do something with it there's usually like a massive foam around spray foam around where the cable goes through actually something like that is a lot easier to do than than spray foam around it, and it's an awful lot more resilient um so these really do have a, a role um there's you do get different qualities of air tightness materials um quite a lot of the the, the cheap stuff that you find is quite susceptible to high humidities um, and it loses its bond. Um, so it, it, these are a, a, it's a good case here if you get what you pay for really with with specialist air tightness materials. So I wouldn't scrimp on that um, because it's going to be there for the long term. Um, it, it's sort of heartbreaking when you test when I test a, a property, say a new build property where cheap air tightness materials have been used and by the time I carry out the test they've failed already um, and that that's not an uncommon thing to happen so so don't scrimp on the fancy materials uh, there's a lot you can do without the fancy materials but there's just they have their place and um, don't don't scrimp on on that side of it really because it's a false economy so how do you what do you do you've got to develop your strategy um so basically you need to think about your home in three dimensions um and get a red pen and literally draw where your air tightness layer is on your your home now this doesn't just apply to if you're looking at trying to achieve you know uh, benefit the passive house retrofit standard or, or any other standard, it's a good way of thinking about it generally because you would be quite shocked at how much air does actually come in through the gap at the floor or um, through where the light fitting is. So develop yourself a strategy for air tightness. So get that pen and literally, where is your air tightness layer on your home? And do it, you know, not only for, um, you know in this section but also for each elevation and every point where you've got a junction or something going through you need to think how am i treating that you know um where you're looking really good levels of air tightness you'd be looking at these sort of things and gaskets if you're looking at sort of just achieving a, a moderate uh level you'd say well for that kitchen waste that's going through i want to make sure it's well sealed around it it's got uh, you know it's been foamed in place or there is there were ways that it's been dealt with it's been thought through i mean it's well worth investing your time on on developing that strategy yourself and then you've got to you need to make sure it's communicated to whoever is doing the work if you're not doing it yourself but well worth committing the time to developing that strategy um so the, the final part of it is um, it, it's getting that, making sure that, that you get the workmanship on site, okay, whether it be you that's doing it or somebody else. Um, so what we've got in the picture on the right is we've got some, we've got a window frame with tape applied to the, um, the reveal and then we've got, uh, we're going to be plastering over the top so we won't be seeing any of this tape after after it's all finished. So in terms of sort of achieving your goals then, so you need to be clear with everybody about what you're aiming to do. Um, and uh, so, so you can't sort of 
assume that people know what you want uh, in terms of air tightness. You need to make sure that they know and and, and uh, go through, explain what you've done in terms of thinking through the strategy, you know, your red line and all this. Um, and, and people often then get on board with it once they understand what you're trying to achieve. On a larger site, or, you know, if you're doing a, uh, um, you know, maybe a whole house uh, retrofit, you'd, you'd have somebody who sort of becomes the champion, really. Now, that might be the builder himself. It might be one of, um, uh, you know, one of his members of staff. It might be you that, that really takes on board making sure that the airtiness is prioritised. Um, it's important that everybody knows that there's, a, you know, that, that everyone has a responsibility with the air tightness. Not that there's any, it, it, you don't want to blame structure. You just want people to understand what you're trying to achieve and that everybody can make a positive contribution to that. Um, but the other side of it as well is if something is accidentally done, you need to really, it needs to be a culture where people know that they're not going to get blamed or anything or penalised by highlighting, because what will happen then is, is problems would get hidden. So it's having quite a, a positive approach with everybody that if something goes wrong, it, people need to tell you, really, because things, I think accidents happen. Um, um, and it's important that you're, you're able to get it sorted while it's all accessible. Diane, can I just um, check with you, because we've had one person ask if the slide can be made any bigger. Um, so this I just slide. want to, yeah, I just wonder if only one person's having a difficulty with enlarging the slide or if, if everybody's seeing it as a bit small. I don't know if it can go any bigger. Um, I can control it on my screen and make it, mine's big, but. Um, I, could, I could revisit it in the questions. I mean, there, to be, oh, uh, hang on. To be honest, there isn't that much detail on it. I mean, it's just no. two layers of tape, and uh, uh, so yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. I mean, if if anyone swapped their speaker view round with their slide view, they might need to swap it back if that's the problem. Um, but otherwise, I'm seeing this big, so um, I expect most people. Yeah, other people are saying the size is fine. So I think it's just individual laptops or computers have got things on different sizes. I don't think it's yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. No, it's, it's OK. There might be scope to, to make it bigger if you're struggling just by changing your own view um, the, of your individual um, laptops. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, so just sort of recapping, you, you try and break it down into those four stages. Know where you're starting from, because that could be you could be in wildly different places from your neighbor or from your friend who's just retrofitted their house. Decide what you're aiming for. You can develop the strategy. You, that's something that you, you're able to do yourself and then make sure the implementation is good. Um, so uh, yeah, break it down. But the thing is, it's not all about air tightness. So you need to think, you can't think about air tightness in isolation. Um, you need to think wider than than that and the example i've got here this is a property that was that was uh had a deep retrofit and um uh this is the um the fan in the uh the bathroom which was uh, which sort of provided a background flow rate of air in the building and then had uh, a boost setting so when the shower was being used the uh, airflow rate ramped up but there were some issues with that and and it actually has a very fine filter on it and so you're asking that fan to do quite a lot and um, um this was an example where i used um sort of data loggers and things looking at what was actually happening we realized that the fan had been set incorrectly as well so there's lots of other things you've got to look at you cannot look at air tightness alone you have to look at it's in combination with ventilation. You're also looking at fabric, you know, uh, thermal performance as well. So you've got to look at everything as, as, as a whole. Great. Okay. And that's me. And that is the end of my presentation. 
Thank you so much, Diane. That's been really interesting and really clear and some really great images there that, uh, that really sort of bring to life how this works. Because of course, this is all invisible in our homes to a very large extent. And it's only when you start to knock things about a bit or get out a thermal camera that you start to see what's really going on. So thank you so much for that. That's been really interesting. If you've got other questions that come up, they might be covered in our next webinars or you might want to talk to us about um, an advice call with somebody at CAFS on retrofit or just a one-off question. And you might also want to ask us to quote for our full energy advice audits. So the contact details are there and we will be emailing out, as I said, in about a week's time. So all the contact details will be on the email as well. Um, don't need to worry about getting it all down now. We've also got a Facebook page, so look out for that. And first of all, our webinars, our next webinars, we've got the rest of this series covering insulation, ventilation. And for anyone who missed the first unit, the introduction, that's being repeated on the 14th of March. We've got two webinars on windows, starting with choosing high spec windows and secondly, how to install the windows well, whatever windows you've got. And then we'll have more, particularly for builders uh, in April and May, and a few more webinars for householders after Easter. So you can book onto all of those through the CAFS events page. And what I would say is sign up to our newsletter. The CAFS newsletter always contains information about the forthcoming events. So that's a way you can get those, um, that information prompted, you know, remind yourself. Um, we'll send out links to our Facebook page if you're interested in a Green Build Facebook page. Um, the next steps, do sign up, join a webinar. In the email that I'll be sending out, there'll be a survey for your opinions, which you can fill in with your name or anonymously as you prefer. We really want to get your survey responses if you haven't already done it. That would be wonderful. Um, uh, do contact us if you need, if you want any other questions. Thank you so much for every, to everyone who's um, made a donation. I did pop the donation link into the chat. Um, if anyone's interested, it's on the CAFS website. And really, just to finish, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Diane. Thank you to everyone who's attended, who's listened, who's asked a question. And we really hope to see you next time uh, when we do another webinar at some point, you know, one of the other webinars in the future. And, um, and have, a, have a good rest of your evening.